Okay, so we're, we're done with Plato, at least for now. Um, we need to move on and talk a little bit about Aristotle. And um, again, I want to get to his ethics today, but at the outset, we're going to look at um, Aristotle, you know, his life, and, and, and particularly his metaphysics. I'll say a few things about, maybe a little, a bit about his biography. Uh, he was born in Macedonia. We call him a Greek philosopher. Uh, Macedonia was considered a part of the Greek territories when he was born. Northeastern Greece, it's now its own country. Uh, he was born Macedonian. He um, is often referred to as the greatest philosopher of all time. Um, I, I don't like anybody being called the greatest anything of all time. I think that's quite a title to give any person. But I can see why, why people might do this with Aristotle. Um, in terms of influence, I think Plato is the only one that comes close to having the amount of influence that Aristotle had. Of course, they've been around a lot longer, so I guess they've had more time to influence people. Uh, but that being said, uh, he's also a very, uh, uh, he's a very broad thinker. Uh, he has a broad range of inquiry. Uh, of course, he wrote philosophy, but he also wrote about other things that you might not consider philosophy today. Uh, empirical biology, he would take uh, particularly marine life, and he would dissect it, and he had these huge catalogs of uh you know, the reproductive systems of certain organisms and things like that. So he was also a bit of a scientist, a bit of a natural scientist, and um, he was also known for being the tutor to Alexander the Great. Right? When, when Alexander the Great was young, uh, Aristotle was tutoring him for about four years, so um, he's, he's known for being the teacher of Alexander. He also studied uh, at, the, at the Academy Plato School in Athens, and so if, if you look to this painting here, uh, Raphael's School of Athens, uh, that we have, uh, this is supposed to be a representation of the School of Athens. Of course, it's, it's completely inaccurate. It was painted by Raphael, and you've got all these Italians in here mixed in with the Greeks, right? So uh, even Raphael, I think, was himself, he put himself in this painting. We've got Socrates there on the steps. But right in the middle, sort of the focus, uh, is these two these two figures in the center? Anybody know who these two figures are? Plato and Aristotle. Co correct, right? So, so we have, we have we have Plato here. He's on the right, and, and he's pointing upwards, right? And right next to him, we have Aristotle talking to him, and he's got his hand sort of level. Right? So one is sort of he's pointing upwards to the heavens. Maybe Plato's pointing to the this higher world of forms. Whereas uh, Aristotle kind of wants us to get back down to earth a little bit, right? Um, so with Plato, we have a much more idealistic philosophy, a sort of idealism, uh, in, in, in both senses of that word, right? We talk about idealism today, somebody's an idealist, what do we mean? Oh, they just, they won't settle for anything less than perfection, right? So in a sense, he's, he's an idealist in that sense. But he's also an idealist because what is really real for Plato, what are the realest things in the universe? Right, but what are those? Those are forms, right? And forms are ideas. So he's an idealist, right? Those are what are really real to the ideas, not the physical things. Aristotle's approach is much more empirical. What do I mean by empirical? What is empirical, that term? What does that mean, empirical science? Based on. Right, based on observation, right? So where Plato says our observations through our senses are deceiving, they should just be dismissed, and Aristotle wasn't willing to throw all that stuff away, right? We can learn things through our senses. So his, his approach is much more sensual and also more practical, you might say, uh, whereas Plato's aiming for much more formalism, a formal, more perfect type of, uh, of philosophy right, that tries to explain the universe in idealistic terms. So... Um, I don't want to get too much into the details of Aristotle's metaphysics. It tends to get pretty complicated, but there are a few um, there are a few terms that we got to go over. A few concepts, uh, form and matter. These go together for Aristotle, and when he talks about form, he, he means something a little bit different than Plato does. Right? He also talks about four causes. Aristotle says that we can analyze things in terms of four causes. So we've got to go over that. He's also got a, a, an interesting way of dealing with this problem of change. Remember, uh, people like Parmenides and even Plato seem to think that change, or becoming, if you want to use Plato's term, uh, was a problem. It, 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 it uh, was irrational. If I assert change, uh, then things are never stable, and I can't have any stable knowledge concerning those things. And so 
Plato tries to, uh, sorry, Aristotle tries to address this problem, and he does it in a, in a very unique and novel way that's quite, quite distinct from anybody that came before him. Right? So we talk about Plato, uh, his idealistic approach. Um, like Plato, and, and like the pre-Socratics before him, um, Aristotle wanted to discover what was real and what is the nature of what is real. So they had very similar pursuits uh, in, in that regard. But what was the pre-Socratic answer? Well, it varied, but the pre-Socratics tended to be a bit materialistic in their explanations. That's another word that has different connotations today. We talk about people being materialistic. Oh, they're, they're all about money and things. But when I talk about materialism in this class, what I mean is they try to explain Explain the universe in terms of matter, in terms of material. Remember Thales, everything's water. So we had a very materialistic explanation of the universe. And, and Plato couldn't be further from this, right? The material is not real, it's the ideas, it's the higher forms that are real. So um, what's Aristotle's solution? He thought that both ways of dealing with it, both views are way too exclusive. They both oversimplify what's really going on. Right. Plato's uh, philosophy, he thought, uh, was, was problematic because it led to a sort of otherworldliness. There's this other world of forms, uh, and that's where the reality is, that's where truth is, and we're really separated from it. There's this unbridgeable gap, Aristotle thought, between the world of forms and the, the, the physical realm. For Aristotle, there were no two realms, there were no two worlds, there was just the world of actual things. But he wants to keep the values like justice and goodness and things. He wants to keep that, 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 that good stuff from Plato, but what he does with form is, is quite distinct from Plato. He, he tends to relocate form, right? For Plato, form is coextensive with reality. Form is real. Uh, for Plato, or sorry, for Aristotle, form is just one aspect of reality. Everything for Aristotle has two aspects to it. Every individual object is part form and part matter. So if I, um, if I look at this object, for instance, let's just take this stool, and I say, this is a stool, well, um, it has two aspects. It has a form and it has matter. For Aristotle, the form would be all of the properties that it shares with other particular things. Okay, So the form, again, the properties that it shares with other particular things. The matter, for Aristotle, is what distinguishes it from other particular things. Um, Aristotle calls the form, he calls it the, uh, the what-ness, that's kind of a weird word, <laughs> write that up, up here, the what-ness, to his potential. 
potentiality. If something has a certain type of matter, what that means is it has certain qualities that separate it from other things. Right? If I have a lump of clay, that lump of clay has certain qualities that makes it different from uh, a pile of gold. Right? It has certain potential that the gold doesn't have, and the gold has potential that the clay doesn't have. Right? So the matter, the thisness, what separates it from other things, reveals potentiality. When I use it to do something, this is when it becomes actualized. That potential becomes actualized in some form. So what might I do with a lump of clay? What could I make it into? A sculpture, right? A piece of art. And that would be the end of the story because we're done. It's a beautiful sculpture and we're going to use it. We're going to appreciate it. But let's say I turn it into a brick. I take the clay and I make a brick out of it, okay? Now it's got a new form and uh, it has new uh, potential as well, right? It's got new potentiality. What, well, what, is, what is the potentiality of a, of a brick? What can I use a brick for? Yeah, you use it to build a wall, right? Or I, I can, you know, I can do sorts of things with it. I can build with it. I, I create a wall. Why do I create a wall, though? Now, this has potentiality. What's the wall for? What do I use the wall for? Uh, to protect myself, or shelter, whatever. Um, for Aristotle, the universe itself is like this ordered hierarchy of means towards ends. Every piece of matter, right, becomes actualized in a form. It serves a purpose. But that is just the beginning, right? Uh, it, it's always going to establish, uh, it's always going to establish uh, a basis for further change, for further development, for further actualization, right? So the clay becomes the brick, the brick becomes the wall, the wall protects us, right? And then we can sort of look at the whole universe as a chain of all these things. So he separates, he says form is something that really can never be separated from matter, only in our thoughts. You know, we can think about how this is a chair, and in our head that idea is separate somehow, but in actuality, he says, Form and matter are just two aspects of every particular. Everything has matter, and that matter reveals uh, potentiality, which becomes actualized in a form. So, um, interesting distinction he makes here. What exactly does he do with it, and what sort of problems does this, this solve? Well, remember we were talking about the problem of change. Things are changing, but that's irrational. If I say that um, Helen of Troy is beautiful, that might be true when she was alive, but it's not always true. She changes, right? And if I say that, um, I look at a photograph of myself when I was four years old, and somebody asks me, That's, is that you? And I say, yeah, it is me. Well, you don't look like that anymore. Well, of course not. I'm not four anymore, right? Well, then why, are, why do you refer to it as the same person? Aristotle's got a pretty good uh, thought experiment. He says... If uh, you had a ship that was you know, a sailboat or something, and it was really old, it had been around for like a hundred years, and in that hundred years, every part of it had been replaced, so that none of the original parts from the original ship were still there, right? The mast had been replaced, everything eventually had been replaced. Is it still the same ship? No. You say no? They call the same ship. They have it's called by the same name, but but it, every part of it has been replaced. Every single part. It took a while. It wasn't like they replaced it all at once, because that would be obviously a new ship. But it, you know, they took one board off and put a new one in. Took another board off a couple years later and put a new one in. And eventually, hundred years later, it's completely uh, and all the material is completely new. Would it still be the same ship? Yes. You say no. You say yes. Uh, well, if you say no, what about me? Haven't all my cells been replaced? Every cell that I've ever had? So how can you call me, me? Okay? Here's the problem, right? We're changing, and eventually we might completely change our constitution, completely what we're constituted of. Do we cease to be what we were? Well, how does Aristotle deal with this? He's got a pretty novel way of doing it. Uh, because of his distinction between matter and form, he might say something like, look, um, we take an acorn, we put it in the ground, we start to water it, it gets sunlight, it's really good soil, so it starts to draw nutrients, and the roots start to, to take form, and then, then what happens, it, it, re 
reach the surface, it, it becomes an oak tree, right, if everything works out. Well, um, what is this it that I'm describing, right? I, I, I'm talking about, I had an acorn to begin with, now I have an oak tree. But I kept, in this whole process, I'm going, it, I put it in the ground, it started to take root, it became an oak tree. What is this constant it that is there throughout the whole process? What is changing and what is staying the same? What do you think he's going to say? Is the matter changing or is the form what is changing? The form. He says the form is going to change. That's why he, his, his use of this word is quite different from Plato's, right? Its form changes. It's still the same it. It's this acorn. This acorn has changed forms. Now, you know, you know much about science, you know, well, there's more matter than there was to begin with. So, sure, maybe that acorn is there, but it's usurped all sorts of other material. But still, I still think he's got a bit of a solution here. Change does happen, sure. Matter is constant. That's always there. It changes its form. So, um, and, you know, for Aristotle, I'm sort of repeating myself here, but you know, all things have a particular form. That form reveals purpose. Uh, it re reveals a function. It reveals, uh, the word he uses, a telos. Telos. This can mean an aim or, or a use or a function. Usually it gets translated as either aim or end. But the word end, I think, is kind of confusing to people because they're thinking, oh, the end of the book or the end of this table. No, it's like a means to an end, right? That, to which, uh, that towards which you are aiming. So everything has a function. It's aiming towards some telos. And when it gets its aim and it finishes, it becomes actualized in a form. That provides the basis for the development of other things. Right, the oak tree uh, is there, and I guess now uh, you know it produces oxygen, which we all use. So the universe is this. Uh, of course, we're not God, so we can't see the whole picture, says Aristotle. But if we understand what something is aiming towards, then we can understand the process that leads up to it. So we'll never know the whole picture, but we can at least understand sections of this development. So. Um, these stages are a plurality, but the purpose, he thinks, is unified. There's some unification to the overall change that, that occurs in the universe. Uh, each stage appears as the actualization of form of the preceding stages, and there's this articulation of structure throughout all of the different stages. Uh, it's discernible because it moves towards, again, it moves towards a telos, it moves towards an aim or an end. Now, we can also, um, we can get a little bit more analytical with Aristotle. He talks about four causes. So, when I look at an object and I try to analyze it, I can analyze it in terms of form and matter, but I can even further parse this up with these four causes. Uh, for Aristotle, there are four causes. We really only think of causality in one sense. We have, I guess, forgotten the other types of causes. When we're thinking cause, we're probably thinking more of the efficient cause. But for him, there are others. There's a material cause, a formal cause, and a final cause. Well, he wouldn't have been familiar with something like that. Well, maybe he would, but he wouldn't know the material it was made out of. Surely they had schools back there. But let's think of something like uh, that he might have been more familiar with, something like an old battle axe, right? Um, nice Greek battle axe. The material cause for him, this would be the material that it is made of. So what would the material cause for that battle axe be? Iron. Iron or whatever metal that's being used for it, right? If it has a leather handle, leather, whatever. So that material, material components that they created. The, the efficient cause, this is, again, what I, what I said earlier, this is kind of how we think of causality. So what do you think he means by efficient cause? What would the efficient cause of the axe be? Uh, and what do we mean by cause? When we talk, when I say something caused something else, what does that mean? When A causes B. It makes something else happen. So what makes the battle axe happen? So that is more of the final cause, right? That's what its use is, what I'm using it for. That would be the final cause. 
But but uh, what cre- who who or what creates or makes the blacksmith? The right? Uh, they're the efficient cause. And I guess if you wanted to get real technical, you might say, oh well, it's the pressure that the blacksmith applies and the heat and all the you know chemical reactions. But that's what brings it about. Uh, that's the efficient cause to the, the axe. Uh, what is the formal cause? Well, that's just what form it takes, and it's an axe, so that's its form, its formal cause. And its final cause, like you said, Joshua, self-defense. I have it so I can cut off the enemy's, hack off the enemy's head or whatever, right? It's, it's to, to fight with, okay? So he says for everything in the universe, there will be four causes to it, and this really works nicely with man-made objects, as we saw with the axe. It's pretty easy and straightforward to come up with the four causes for things like that. But when it comes to just naturally occurring things, it might not be so easy. Let's just think about something like a stone or just a little pebble, right? Well, it's material cause, not too difficult. We could talk about what type of rock it is. Um, Efficient cause, I guess. If we know more about geography, geology, and things like this, uh, we know our science. We could talk about how the stone was created and all this stuff, erosion. Uh, formal cause, it's a stone, it's a pebble or whatever. But final cause, what, what do I use it for? What is its purpose? Let's say it's just like a little pebble, and I can't use it for material to build with. It's like not the proper type of stone or something like that. What's the purpose of it? What's that? Gravel. For gravel. Right. Um, part of the earth. You're getting clo- a lot closer to what he would say. Um, Aristotle's going to tell us that everything that exists, obviously it has a purpose. That purpose is something that is natural to it, right? What it wants to actualize, what it wants to aim towards, is something that is natural for it. Well, Aristotle, like a lot of these ancients, he only knew of four elements, right? He didn't have this periodic table of the elements, right? There's just air, and there's fire, and there's earth and water. And these elements, he says, they aim towards what is natural for them. It's natural that fire and air go up. They move upwards. They move towards what's natural for them. And earth and water fall. They go down because they want to go to the center of the earth. That's their natural spot, right? So their final purpose is to go to the center. And that's why no matter how much air you have, it's completely light. It's always light. Uh, You can keep adding air and air. It doesn't weigh anything, right? Same thing with fire. It's always going upwards, right? The same is not true of Earth. No matter how small it is, will fall. No matter how heavy it is, will fall. This was the going theory of gravity until Galileo. Why did he think this, though, that things go towards the center of the Earth uh, because they're heavy and things go outwards because they're light. Well, where was Earth located, according to him? It, 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 where was its place in the universe? Earth was in the exact center, the perfect center of the universe. And Aristotle knew, you know, at least he thought he knew, that the Earth was round. He knew it was spherical. He did not think it was flat, right? Most educated people did not think it was flat, right? The common man might have. He thought Earth was in the center of the universe, and so all the heavy things fall towards the center, Earth and water. All of the light things go towards the outskirts of the universe. So that explains gravity until Galileo basically shows that this isn't the case, and and also that we're not the center of the universe, and a lot of other things, but we have to wait until Unit 2 to get all the details of that. But uh, so that's, that's how he explains natural objects, right? Uh, but what about, what about me? Um, if I wanted to analyze myself in terms of four causes, right? Uh, material cause, okay, I'm made out of flesh and bone and all this stuff, okay. Efficient cause, uh, mom and dad got together, a little hanky-panky, and I popped out uh, nine months later, okay, or you know, whatever, I was created, however you want to put it. Formal cause, I'm a male, I'm a human, that's the form I take. Why am I here? What's my purpose? To teach us philosophy. (laughs) (laughs) If if I'm good at it, if 
that's what I if that's what I have a natural aptitude towards, that is exactly what Aristotle would say. Um, I have a function, and it somehow has to do with the, the society that I live in, right? I'm serving a purpose, and I have my own goal, right, which is based on my unique characteristics, right, my matter, my potentiality, what separates me from everybody else. Um, but when I reach that higher goal of my own, I'm also supposed to be helping the greater good, right, of society, right, by teaching philosophy or being a doctor or whatever it is that I do, right? This is all dependent upon my uniqueness, you know, my unique characteristics, but that's pretty much what he's going to say, right? But he does have one word that he uses to describe the telos or the aim that we're all aiming towards. Why do I teach philosophy? Or why does somebody become a doctor? Or why does somebody become a nurse or a, you know, whatever they become? Why do we do what we do? What are we aiming towards, all of us? The greater good, well, in, in a sense, the greater good is something that society at large has to aim towards, right? But each individual has their own personal good. He, but he, again, he does use one word to describe this thing takes different forms, there's different versions of it for different people, but we're all aiming for what? Why are you here in this class? Yeah, okay, so you want to be successful, um, but why do you want to be successful? You want to be happy, right, you want to be happy, and Aristotle thinks that is the end that we're all aiming towards, right, that I, I, I want to be successful because I think if I'm successful, I'll, I'll be happy, you know, I'll have a good life. So happiness is what we're aiming for. And I don't want to get the details of exactly what he means by happiness, because that's your job next class uh, on the 18th. That's what your response is going to be over. What does Aristotle mean by happiness? You know, what does he not mean? This sort of thing. So I don't want to give you too many details, but yeah, you're right. That's, that's what he says. Ultimately, we're all aiming for, for happiness. Right? That's the highest aim, the highest telos for man. Okay, well, uh, we're almost done with metaphysics. I'm happy. We're making good time. So, um, should I leave this up or no? I'm going to move on. As I said, uh, Aristotle sees the, the universe as this ordered, rational whole. We can't see the full picture, obviously. We're, we're humans. We only have a very narrow view to it. But as I was saying, he sees everything as a process, right? Everything's developing towards some goal towards some telos. And he also believes that this process is infinite. That all of these stages go back forever to infinity, and the future we look towards is also infinite. It will keep going on forever and ever. In other words, change or motion or becoming always has been. There's never been a time in the universe when there wasn't change. This is something he insists. Uh, and I'll give you the argument for it. Why does he think this? Um, it's not the easiest argument to follow, so maybe I'll try to use um, uh, an example. And maybe this is a little outdated. Do they still sell these these toy guns with the, the rubber band guns? Or might you, I don't even, even if you don't have a toy gun, you might just look it up, like in, uh, Google Images, rubber band gun. You know, Sometimes you can just do it with your actual hand. You just sort of wrap a rubber band around your hand, and then it's, you know, your thumb is basically holding back the rubber band. You go like this, and it shoots, right? I used to do that when I was a kid. That's kind of a, I was not a well-behaved child, right? Um, so I would do this kind of Dennis the Menace stuff. So let's imagine the universe is the rubber band, right? Uh, and it's being held back by the thumb. So change is not happening, right? Aristotle says that's kind of how it would have to be. If there wasn't any change going on, there had to be some force holding it back, stopping it from changing, okay? So let's call that time T, right? Time T, the first the time before there was no change, right? Well, in order for change to happen, in order for that rubber band to move, what do I have to do? I, yeah, I have to move my thumb. Isn't that change? So if there was a time when there was no change, then for change to start, for the first change to start, another change before it had to, to begin, right? So, so Aristotle's saying, if there's a time with no change, there had to be a change before that, and that doesn't make any sense, it's illogical. So change has just always been going on. There's, it's always been, and it always will be, right? And, and time is infinite. Motion, time, 
is eternal. Something had to change before change occurred. That is a completely nonsensical statement, so we have to just assert that change has always occurred. So if change has always occurred, it's always occurring, if the universe is infinite, and if the universe has a cause, Aristotle thought everything had a cause, well, if the universe is infinite, and it was caused by something, Whatever caused it must have itself been infinite. So he thinks that there's such a thing as well, what he calls the unmoved mover, or sometimes it's translated as the prime mover. This is his idea of God. Right? This is the cause of the universe. And it's not a cause in the sense of an efficient cause. It's not like... Um, if you, if you know those, if you've ever seen like a stack of dominoes, people will spend hours, days sometimes stacking up a bunch of dominoes, making it all intricate, uh, and then they just come over and they just knock one domino over and you see all this stuff move around. You don't want to think of God or, or Aristotle's God, you don't want to think of the unmoved mover as the person that hits the first domino. That's not God for Aristotle, right? God or the unmoved mover is what allows those physical laws to even take place. The unmoved mover is the cause of causes. And that's the type of causality, I suppose, that is beyond human comprehension. Aristotle seemed to think that. But we know that whatever caused this infinite process itself must be infinite. So the unmoved mover is infinite. That's one thing that he reasons about him. He must be infinite cause the infinite universe, we must be infinite. I said he, but if I say he, that, that I don't think that's right, because for Aristotle, the unmoved mover is pure form. It's the only thing that is pure form. Remember, every, everything else is part form and part matter, but the unmoved mover is pure form, pure actuality. Remember, actuality is another word for, for form. Why would you say God or the unmoved mover is pure actuality? There's no potential in God. Well, that would assume that God has some things to do to become perfect. God has some things inside of himself or whatever. I, I don't want to say he. Uh, traditionally, you know, God, he. But he doesn't have a gender. He doesn't have a body. It's just pure intellect, pure mind, right? Uh, pure form, pure actuality. It doesn't need to develop into something else because it's pure perfection. Why would I want to change and become something else? I'm pure form, pure actuality. Its thought is, well, what we would call non-discursive thought. Okay, the way that we think, the way that we understand things is discursively. Humans think discursively more than anything else. Well, what does that mean? Well, it's kind of like when you're you're doing a very difficult problem in mathematics, maybe like a word problem. You look at this problem and you're like, oh, geez, this is really complicated. I'm going to have to do a few different things. I've got these different operations I have to do. First, I've got to divide, and then I've got to come over here and then multiply, and then I have to subtract these two figures that I get from those operations, right? Well, the unmoved mover doesn't think in steps. The unmoved mover is supposed to see the full picture all at once. So if you present the most difficult calculus problem to the mind, this universal mind, the unmoved mover, he would see the solution instantaneously. Not just the solution, but every possible solution instantaneously. He sees the full picture all at once. And because of the unmoved mover's perfection, the universe wants to try to emulate it. It is an object of emulation. All things that are aimed towards a telos are aimed towards that pure form of the unmoved mover without ever quite reaching it. So the unmoved mover is kind of the motor of the universe. Uh, we use the term in philosophy, entelechy, right? underlying reason for something, right? The, this is the underpinning of the universe, the motor of the universe. All things, insofar as they're aiming for anything, they're aiming towards this pure form, this pure perfection, without ever quite attaining it. 
What are some other things about the unmoved mover? Well, um, we call it Theos, uh, at least Aristotle does, and that means God. So this would be his version of God. But it's not, um, it's not some type of entity that is, is really concerned with us. So, you know, a lot of the things that Aristotle says about the unmoved mover, uh, they work quite well with Christian and Ju Ju uh, Judaism, with Christianity, with Judaism, uh, with Islam. These ideas were very influential to some of the early Islamic scholars and the theologians and the Christian theologians. But this aspect of the unmoved mover uh, is not quite kind to that type of inquiry because for Aristotle, the unmoved mover is not concerned with us. In fact, the unmoved mover is not even thinking about us. Well, what is the unmoved mover thinking about? Well, he sees the universe as a whole, but the universe as a whole really uh, can be summed up to, to uh, moving towards the perfection of the unmoved mover. The way that Aristotle puts it is that unmoved mover's thoughts are always about pure form. The only thing that the, the unmoved mover can think about are, is pure form, pure actuality. The, the unmoved mover does not think about particulars. That's another reason I don't think a lot of, you know, Aquinas, he would say, you know, God knows uh, the position of every hair on your head, right? He knows how many grains of sand are on the beach, right? Uh, Aristotle says, no, he doesn't. He's not worried about that trifling stuff, right? That's just, who cares about your hair, right? Uh, he just knows about the, the universals, okay? I keep saying he, but that's being naughty, right? The unmoved mover is thinking about nothing but pure form, and the unmoved mover is the only thing in the universe that is pure form, so then what the heck is the unmoved mover thinking about? Himself. Yes, or itself. Or itself. itself, yeah, you're doing it too, right? Yeah, thinking about itself. The unmoved mover spends eternity contemplating its own perfection, and this contemplation is this, is this motor, this intellect key, uh, that, that moves the universe, that gets this whole process going. So that's that when it comes to uh, Aristotle's metaphysics. Um, we'll see when we get to the medieval period, we'll, we'll get a glimpse of, of how influential he was uh, to some of the earlier Christian and Islamic theologians, but that's for another class. For